Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier. Thank you for stopping by. It's been a rather busy day. Last night we had a blast at the Spectre premiere in Nairobi. Um, this is the James Bond premiere. And we've done a little video of the Jaguars um, being driven by Christian, the British Ambassador, High Commissioner, um, from Mothaiga. And uh, it's, it's actually quite cool. It's like a little road trip through Nairobi. See if you recognize all the places, but we'll upload that a little bit later today. Then, of course, I went to the Safaricom first half earnings release and uh, I tweeted this. Um, it's now trading at 15.05, which is up more than 5%. And I said, uh, you know, the signal is the price action. Those were really muscular results. I'll get to them in a moment. And then I had a presentation about the macroeconomy that I gave to Catalyst. I'll put up um, the title of my uh, presentation and certainly when you look at what's happened on the macro indicators across Africa, it's been maximum volatility. Macro thoughts, Holger, the world's finances in one picture, and uh, have a look at this. Home thoughts, I've resisted temptation for two and a half minutes at least. My redemption is sure. Malcolm Lowry under the volcano, which is a book I read many years ago. And it's um, around the Day of the Dead uh, in Mexico. And uh, I'll put up an image I found from the Telesur. But Under the Volcano, which is based at this time of the Day of the Dead, uh, tells the story of Jeffrey Furman, an alcoholic British consul in the small Mexican town of Kohanak on the Day of the Dead, 2nd of November 1938. The book takes its name from the two volcanoes that overshadowed Kohanak. Under the Volcano was Larry's second and last complete novel and I really struggled to read it. It's sort of uh, a drunken dream sequence, as it were. And, uh, you know, I was quite young when I tried to read it and I don't think the clear idea of where he was coming from. Trudeau's parity cabinet is a first in a country where women started voting in 1916. The parity cabinet was Trudeau's decision alone and took some of his advisers by surprise. Justin believes this is really important, their voice at the table where decisions get taken. Um, and I'll put up this image of uh, Canada's first equal cabinet with 15 men and 15 women because it's 2015. But what struck me was it had a number of Sikhs in there as well. On France 24, Burma Suki vows to be above president in new government. I think she's a wonderful lady, but she disappointed me tremendously by saying absolutely nothing on the matter of the Rohingyas. Philip Hammond, whom I met at Christian Turner's residence uh, last, was it this year, um, is saying there's a significant possibility ISIS was behind the crash of the Russian plane. A US official says ISIS bomb is most likely reason behind Russian jet crash. On the 25th of August, I said since then, planes have been falling out of the sky like flies, continuing to, I was saying the signal announcing this new arrhythmic normal in the world we live in was the disappearance of MH370. We then learnt that a Russian cargo plane crashed in the South Sudan as well. So that's the whole sequence of events, which is difficult to sift through at times. Um, it seems that the US does not want any sovereign state to exist in the region. The model is to create replicas of the Gulf states elsewhere in the region. This is Tarek Ali. He also says, the violence in Ankara frightened many people, but Erdogan's cultivation of ISIS suggests that the destabilization of the country is going to continue. We must now neither laugh nor cry, but understand, he says. And then uh, Jeremy Scahill, who I follow, and who um, works on The Intercept, and has done a lot of uh, deep diving into, for example, the assassination, drone assassination program. Uh, tweeted that one should watch this documentary by PBS inside Assad Syria and I think it was I watched most of it yesterday it's very powerful and gives a point of view that's not uh, forthcoming most of the time US ramps up pressure on Beijing over the South China Sea Admiral Harry Harris commander of the US Pacific Command deliberately inflamed tensions yesterday 
during his trip to Beijing, he emphatically declared that the US military would continue to fly, sail and operate whenever and wherever international law allows. The South China Sea is not and will not be an exception, he said. And I did not know this. For months, Harris pressed President Obama to give the green light for freedom of navigation operations within the 12 nautical mile territorial limits surrounding Chinese controlled reefs. In March, the Admiral implied that China's land reclamation activities in the region posed a threat, describing it as a great wall of sand. October 27th, the USS Larsen, a guided missile destroyer, intruded within the 12 mile limit, surrounding at least one of the Chinese administered illets in the Spratly Islands. First direct challenge to Beijing's claims. Washington insists that under international law, several of China's reefs before land reclamation were submerged at high tide and therefore do not generate territorial waters. Harris declared that the USS Lassen was simply engaged in a routine operation. We've been conducting freedom of navigation operations all over the world for decades, and no one should be surprised by them, he said. We're back to that period in December 2013 when I said the pivot of Asia was bearing its fangs, it's bearing its fangs again. International markets, the euro has dropped below 109, it's last training at 108.61, as Yellen keeps the door open for liftoff in December. Markets are pricing that to the chance for a December hike at 58%. Look at US two-year yields, Holger tweeted this graph, highest level in four and a half years, they're the most sensitive to possible interest rate movements, backing up, expecting a rate hike. Here is the trade weighted dollar, which is the challenge for the Fed because it's strengthened considerably through this period. And then have a look at this Bitcoin versus gold. Question one asked, but it's been a bit of profit taking lately is Bitcoin replacing gold. Currency markets Euro, as I said, 108.63, dollar index 97.90, Japanese yen quite a move, 121.90. Swissy 0.9969 pound is at 153.79. Aussie um, 0.7135. Um, India rupee 65.775. South Korean one 11.3894. Real 3.8009. Egyptian pound 80.338 in the rand. Just shy of 14. Let me put up a three month chart of the dollar index and its trading as if this December rate hike is a given. Euro dollar, have a look at the three month chart. Draghi has dragged this down very, very effectively. Then have a look at this chart of the Dow Jones versus Brent crude. Brent crude backing down again, back below 50. And uh, just the day before yesterday, it had pop, it's now at 49.24 and traded above 51 at one. Commodity markets, gold under pressure, 11.08, glad I kept that stop loss where I did. Crude oil, $46.75, let me put up a three month chart, failed towards the top of the range. Question is, do we go and try it again or do we just go start going down? Highest single category year on year price increase was for five carat vivid blue diamonds at 11%. Um, demand for blue diamonds may have been magnified by the excitement being generated by the upcoming Sotheby's auction headlined by the Blue Moon, one of the world's most important fancy vivid blue diamonds. Uh, the flawless 12.03 carat Blue Moon diamond is valued at £35 million. Pounds. Holger again, camel shaped chart. Dubai stocks near bear after steepest retreat in two months. Coming down to Africa, photojournalist tweeted President Jakaya Kikwete's last day at the State House, November the 4th. The new President Magafuli has been inaugurated as we speak. Interesting piece in foreign policy, Africa's softer, gentler coup d'etat. Across the continent, military takeovers are out, nasty legal maneuvering is in. There's a new fashion among African presidents bent on clinging to power, the constitutional coup. Military coups are no longer de rigueur, in part because the African Union has said it won't recognize governments that come to power by means of such blatant tactics, saying that instead African leaders are unwilling to abide by term limits or unfavorable election results, prefer to simply change the laws 
and constitutions that stand in their way. All too often, their legal maneuvering is accompanied by human rights abuses and brutal crackdowns on those who object. Talking about Denis Sassen Gueso, nearly 72-year-old President of the Republic of Congo, he went down this route. Um, talking about Dos Santos in Angola, Teodoro Obiang of Equatorial Guinea, uh, of Mugabe, all in power for more than 35 years. Um, and this is a big challenge, and you know, it might get worse before it gets better. Maldives has declared a state of emergency on Wednesday as the Indian Ocean Island nation's political upheaval intensified following a suspected assassination attempt on the president. I put up an image that Curtis Shin put up. I like this photograph from Papa Machoyo in Tanzania. Tanzania is green, black, blue, and yellow, he said. And look at the photograph. Angola's ruling party attacks interference over detentions. Ruling party in Angola has attacked demands for the release of rights activists accused of plotting acts of rebellion as interference in the country's institutions. Those who always fought using all means, including military, to destroy the party are not pleased with the country's stability and evolution achieved mainly since the attainment of peace in 2002. Uh, human rights groups have accused Dos Santos uh, of leading a government that commits abuses, including extrajudicial killings, arbitrary detention of critics, and curbs on freedom of speech. The slump in oil is straining the economy. Well, on the 21st of September, I said President Eduardo dos Santos is leveraging the balance sheet, drawing down loans to make up the shortfall, and stamping down hard on any whisper of dissent. I alluded to the fact that really it was more of a regime-saving way of looking at things rather than a national interest issue. On the 10th of August, I said the end is nigh for crude oil and oil producers from Caracas to Luanda, from Riyadh to Abuja. Richard Kapuczynski famously said, if the crowd disperses, goes home, does not reassemble, we say the revolution is over. And I was saying the revolution is only just beginning. Angola has raised a total of $1.5 billion in its debut eurobond with a yield of 9.5% to 10-year bond. Donald Kabaruka, speaking at the EYSGF Africa, says crises in Africa rarely stay within the confines of a single country. E, the Economic Intelligence Unit, why is trade diversification needed in Africa? Have a look at their infographic. South African all share up 9.47% this year, outperforming the rest of sub saharan Africa by quite a margin. Dollar Rand, let me put up a three month chart, looks like we're about to go to a fresh record low. Egyptian pound 803, Egyptian stock market down 15.82% this year. Nigeria down 16.07% this year, Ghana down 12.21% this year, and of course Kenya's down as well. That's why I thought that I was mentioning South Africa's performance. Glencore can't fire workers at the Zambian unit, the president has said. This is President Edgar Lungu said he won't allow Glencore's local unit to cut about 4,000 jobs, and that the nation, which is Africa's second biggest copper producer, will find other investors to take over mining operations if the current owners have failed. Floods in Douala, damage caused Cameroon. Uh, uh, have a look at this photograph. Okay, let's move on to Kenya, where obviously the big headline event was Safaricom's first half earnings, which were released uh, before the market opened. I got there about 20 past six because it started raining and I got worried about the traffic. Very strong results. Earnings per share up. 22.91%. Voice revenue uh, up 3.48%. Um, so, you know, people have been talking about voice being dead. That was a pretty creditable performance. Messaging revenue up 11.29%. Mobile data revenue, a standout, up 40.92%. And PESA revenue up 24.12%. Total revenue up 22.54% of 97.22 billion. That's a strong indicator of what's been going on. Uh, EBITDA up 15.84%. Earnings per share up 22.91%. Free cash flow was down 38.5%. That's because they funded the, uh, the security program for the government. 
They hiked guidance, full year guidance, net income upgrade to 35.5 to 36.5 billion, previously 32 billion to 34 billion. Uh, voice revenue up 4%, non-voice revenue by 24%. Bob said at uh, at the settings release, think of Safaricom as a platform. He says, we think e-commerce has a big future. Safaricom voice revenue grew by 4%, non-voice by 24 uh, Data usage up 78%, a 33% increase in smartphones on the network. What was interesting is 78% uh, increase in mobile data usage offset what was a sharp decline in price by about 40%. I thought there were really strong numbers, plain and simple. Um, look at the revenue acceleration. and Basically, that was reflected, I think, in the price action that we're seeing as we speak. It's above back above 15. Kenya Shilling at 102, the figure Nairobi all shared will bounce today because of Safaricom strong showing. But that's down 15.96% as of this morning. NSC 20 bounced 0.01% off a 39-month low yesterday, but will bounce harder today. That's down 25.08% year-to-date. Um, I'm running behind the curve, but I think, you know, Safaricom being a bellwether stock of the Nairobi Securities Exchange, I think it will, um, it, it, it will, it has turned sentiment, there's much more blue than there is red for a change. And I think we'll see some follow through as people look more, you know, there are value opportunities in a bear market. Once again, thank you for stopping by.